is going on? I want to welcome you from Half Court. I am Sean Murphy, and today I am joined by one of my favorite people in the basketball sphere. If you're not subscribed, be sure you're subscribed to Three Cone on YouTube. It is my guy, Cone. My guy, how you doing? It's good to see you. We were just talking you, before this about the, the playoff run that your Thunders went on, some of the awesome work you've been doing over the last year. You're You're doing some good stuff, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, we we're talking a little bit about uh, some playoff hoops. Uh, yeah, for those of you that don't know, I'm a Thunder fan. Uh, unfortunate end to the whole thing. Uh, amazing season. I mean, I they blew away my expectations. Like I felt I've always been pretty optimistic. I had us as a six seed. I remember when I made my YouTube video about my preseason predictions and I had us as a six seed. People were pretty mad at me in the comments. They said that, oh, you're very biased. There's no way they'll be that good. They're still young to an experienced and then they're the one seed. So yep. I guess even I, as an optimistic fan, was a little bit pessimistic in the end. Um, and then they went ahead and lost to the Mavericks, who obviously ended up in the NBA final. So uh, not too mad about that. I'm cool with that. Um, I would have loved to see them in that position. And I think they had a shot. Just I think that inexperience did show a little bit in that series with a lot of guys who were just lights out shooting the ball all season, yep. uh, failing to kind of find their shot. You know, Aaron Wiggins struggled a little bit. Case and Wallace, who was so like perfect all year, especially as a rookie, had a couple of mistakes in some of the latter games that really piled up towards the end. Yep. Um, really anybody but Shea was a bit up and down throughout the series. And I mean, Shea was a monster. He was the best player in that series. Um, you know, I think Luka is the better player overall, but Shea was the best player in that series individually. He might be the and... most consistent player. Like Luka might be the best in yeah. basketball, but I think Shea might be the most consistent because he just goes out and does it every single night. Yeah, which is really all I want to see from this run is growth from the team. They get that experience and for Shea to show that he is that guy that I know he is. We got all those things. Um, and I think going forward, you know, getting more experience, the Thunder will be perfectly fine. Like we talked about before the show. Um, I love how I turn this into me finding a way to ramble about the Thunder. Hey, the podcast, own, I wouldn't which... want it any other way. <laughs> I also love talking about the Thunder. So it's totally okay. We're before before I ask you uh, some questions about another young team that's in a little bit of a different mm -hmm. position than the Thunder, I am just curious. I've seen you post some some edits, so I think I have a relative idea of what you want them to do. But wh what would be your dream off season for the Oklahoma City Thunder? Dream off season. Um. Well, trading for Jokic would be number one. Uh, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Really, I think. One, I mean, one guy who's been talked about in relation to the Thunder for months at this point is Lowry Markkinen. Uh, he feels to me like he makes a lot of sense. I'm firmly in the camp that Chet Holmgren is a center, and that is the best role for him going forward. I do think there's a world where we add another big, like I know Jared Allen is a name that's been floated around a little bit that I wouldn't hate. Uh, I do think Chet could work in that role, but I think part of the reason why that people don't understand as to why the Thunder were so good this season is because Chet is that floor spacer, that uh, stretch big who can also put the ball on the deck and is a lot faster than a lot of other bigs. Like and we saw in the Pelican series, Jonas was putting up some points down low. You know, he's physically dominant, but he got played off the court a lot of moments because he couldn't keep up with Chet. That's why they yep. had to go smaller with Larry Nance Jr. to try and keep up with him. And I think that's part of the advantage. People say, oh, Chet doesn't really have the physicality to match some of those, you know, really bulky bigs. They don't have the foot speed to match up with Chet. And also yep. that allows him to be very versatile in the offense. It's a big reason why the Thunder were a top five defense this year. I mean, as a rookie, he averaged over two blocks per game and was an anchor of a top five defense. So... To me, the fact that Chet Holmgren didn't end up on an all-defensive team, I think is really unfortunate. I firmly had him on that team. Maybe it's just because I, you know, I am biased, I'll admit that, but also watched a lot of what the Thunder did this season. And he was a game changer. He's one of the best pick and roll defenders in the league, amazing in drop coverage. Whatever scheme you put him in, Chet's gonna be successful. So I'm a believer that long term he is a five. To me, the vision is getting a bigger body at the four that allows Jadab to move down to like the three. Or, you yep. know, even in some worlds, you know, maybe the lineup changes more and he ends up as a two. But I think he's more of that two or that three than that four. We have him playing a lot bigger of a position than he needs to at the moment. So that's part of why I love Lowry, because he gives us a lot of size there, adds more versatility offensively. You know, we're already a top five offense, but you had a guy in Lowry who's a near seven footer that can stretch the floor, put the ball in the deck, do a bit of everything next to Shea. And I think we're talking about one of the favorites. I mean, they are already a number one seed. 
insanity out there in the Western Conference with them. And Lowry isn't like the best defender, but he can hold his own. And when he's playing next to Shea and Jalen Williams and Lou Dort and Chet Holmgren with, you know, case of Wallace off the bench. And if a we lot add, of those weaknesses can be shielded and, and he can complement those guys very well in that end. Exactly. Yeah. Like I'm not worried about, I mean, right now we would be replacing Giddy with Lowry in the starting lineup, which I think would be an upgrade on that yep. end, regardless, just giving us more size and that rebounding. So, yeah, I mean, he is like one of my dream candidates, you know, way more realistically than, again, a guy like, you know, Jokic or any of those top players. Kevin Durant is a name. I know some Thunder fans have floated out there the idea of him returning. I don't know how anybody feels about that. I personally, if a reunion happened, I would, you know, we're trying to compete for a ring here. Like, yep. forget at this point, it, it was 2016. I was 16 years old when that happened. I'm 24 now. If I don't think it's going to happen this offseason, I don't even know if it happens at all. Like if there's even a chance, if he would be open to it, if the organization would be. But I do say just from a perspective of the type of player, Katie would also be like a phenomenal fit. Someone who doesn't yeah. really, he's shown he can be great off ball or on ball. Uh, he's a good defender. He gives us some more size. Like I still think we need to maybe add a little bit more rebounding and that would come from like a backup big, obviously. But yeah, I mean, he's another player that would fit that mold way higher you know, aim than a Lowry Markinen, who I don't even know if Danny Ainge is open to trading him. I know a lot of the reports around the Jazz have been that they might want to compete sooner than later, which I don't really understand. I feel like they're really far away from competing yeah. unless they're planning on making this insane splash, which I don't know who's, you know, out there on the market that is like dying to go to Utah at the moment, maybe if they get a better supporting cast, but I don't know. So it's up in the air right now but i think larry is one of my dream guys uh, in terms of free agency like i would love isaiah hartenstein on this team He's oh one yeah of dream pickups oh as yeah putting him as that backup big because chet had one of the best on off numbers in the entire nba playoffs so far the problem was when he was off the court we really lacked that rim protection and isaiah hartenstein was huge for the knicks uh, on both ends really with that team throughout their playoff run on the defensive end he was great all season and then he did have some kind of fall off at points in the playoffs but I think a lot of that is because you know Mitchell Robinson's out and Tom, Tom Thibodeau's got his guys playing like 40 minutes a game because there's a literally no more bodies that they yep. have so I think if you put him in a backup big role behind Chet Holmgren he's one of the best backup bigs probably the best backup big in the league pretty handily unless oh I guess Nas Reed is also up there as well I completely forgot yeah. about the sixth man of the year <laughs> um but <laughs> he'd be firmly yeah, so, in that in those talks for sure yeah I top three for sure because now I'm I gotta remember to look through the names um but I also think like a Nick Claxton would be cool he's another option I like it's probably Isaiah Hartenstein is my number one because I think he's a little bit more versatile offensively at the moment. You know, he's got that little push shot that he really likes to go to. And somehow it always goes in. I swear he's never missed that. Yep. Um, and then on, you know, the defensive end, he brings a lot to the table. Claxton does as well. I think both those guys could theoretically play alongside Chet. You know, you move Chet over to the four if you have to go double big. I don't think you really ever have to. But say you it's one of something it's something you want to experiment with. Like maybe there's just a scheme moment where you're like, oh, this might work. Either one of those guys can play the five and then chat. You just slide him over to the four. He's still got that stretchability. So yeah, those are kind of some ideas I have. And then at the draft, if we don't pick up a big in free agency, I would like to, us to grab another guy at that big man position. Although if we're going to spend money, I would more so like it to, unless we're absorbing like a star's contract or something like that. But I would more so like for us to go for that big in free agency if possible. And then the draft can just be adding another big if we just want more depth there or just, you know, best player available. We'll see who's out there. I know a lot of Thunder fans have mentioned Cody Williams. He's really cool. You know, J-Dub's brother, obviously. So that adds another okay. dynamic there, too. Uh, I know a lot of Thunder friends have also mentioned uh, Kyle Filipowski, who, you know, fits that kind of floor stretching big mold that people want to see with this team. And I think is what we want to have, although, you know, a floor stretching defensive big like would be great behind Chet is like the most valued archetype of player in almost the entirety NBA at this point. So yeah. it's it's hard to grab those guys. Um, and then. Like I like Kalel Ware a lot. I know there have been some concerns about like his motor and stuff, but just strictly from that archetype of player, I think he would be amazing as well. Um, Deron Holmes is a player that I've really fallen in love with early on in this uh, draft process. Or I guess not early on the drafts in like a few weeks at this right. point, but after the Thunder got eliminated, really diving into it, he's a player that as of late, well, the, fans, I've the of process like, begins as soon as your team's done. Yeah, I'm see the things I'm I'm used to it happening way sooner over the past few years. Like oh, yeah. I got so into the cycle of 
okay, Thunder eliminated. They're not going to the playoffs over the past couple of years. It's like, okay, dive into the draft. What pick do we have? Like my whole happiness for the entirety of the summer lies strictly on ping pong balls, yep. which I know you relate to way too much at I this think point. That's where we initially bonded was over so. the fact that we were living our lives in the lottery, you know, hell and having mm-hmm. to just rely on where in the heck those balls bounce. And uh, for the Pistons, two years in a row they have not they bounced have well the biggest fall in the history of the nba lottery so yeah i want to i want to ask actually like what was the so you're i'm sure you're watching the lottery live like, oh yeah yep what is the what is the reaction as that happens like what hits you in that moment i mean for for pistons fans i i think the 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 term is really just like the proverbial salt in the wound mm-hmm. um you know i think it's just reliving a lot of the you know the fall that was that was last year um, you know, I think for, for Pistons fans, the the number five in the Wimby draft is just going to be the wound that, you know, will will be there for a while, especially with how mm. last season went and with how good Wimby was in contrast. And although, yeah. yes, we still got an awesome player in Asar Thompson, and I and I still think that, you know, the Pistons do have some like solid pieces to build around. It is just one of those things where it just felt like, you know, things really went even farther as far as like okay we knew that this draft wasn't going to fix whatever problems the pistons had in fact Mm -hmm. the conversations before this draft around you know around like pistons twitter and just around like the fan sphere was you know whether or not they even keep the pick right but Mm -hmm. you know just it's it was kind of the it was kind of the death proverbial death to the philosophy that the organization was kind of going under over the last few years which was just you know like relying on lot you know relying on the lottery building through the draft getting you know as best odds as possible and i think you know we were the pistons were kind of the team that had to uh bear the example of how radical the tanking rules have changed Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting because they were an organization that resisted tanking for so long and so the second they did they now they now uh bear the, those uh you know those those consequences so to speak mm-hmm. but you know at the same time when uh, I, I think when you look at the teams that are remaining right i think the things that a lot of them have in common while yes um you know some lottery luck definitely helped in a lot of ways they made their own luck right like boston they went and traded for those picks that became jalen brown and jason tatum and although they won the lottery the year they won Tatum, they still traded back to be able to go get him and add even more to it. And Dallas, yeah. they went and moved up and got Luka Doncic, right? So I think, you know, while I think lottery luck will always play a role in team success and you you will still need that certain amount of luck. And Detroit did, did get it a few years ago. We did get Cade Cunningham, who in my opinion is still a, you know, vastly overlooked player who if, if he had an adequate roster around him, would be in the conversation with those other number one picks. I would love your your perspective and thoughts on that, you know, as an outsider. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I would just say essentially, you know, it was kind of the, you know, the Pistons already were in a spot where they needed to look at getting getting older <clears throat> and getting more veterans. But, you know, that was kind of the, you know, I would say the death, the nail in the coffin, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, even with like OKC, when we had the, uh, you know, we got Chet, not last year, but the year before in 2022, we got Chet at the second overall pick, which was incredible. Like that's the guy won the whole time. And then we also got Jada with that 12th pick, which came from the Paul George trade, of course, Shagel just Alexander trade. Let me call it that. Um, and the, uh, you know, the Thunder also trade up in that draft to grab Uzman Jang. And something we've heard is that if they didn't trade up leap like their own pick to go get that, there were a couple of teams that were trying to trade up ahead of them and get Jalen Williams before them. So yep. The Thunder also, in a way, did that same thing where they said, we're not going to risk anybody trading up and taking our guy. We will be the team to trade up, and we'll just grab Usman Jang, who we like too. So it is interesting how it's changed a little bit in the NBA with that that mold. And that's something, you know, I've given Sam Presti a lot of credit for is also, you know, you have to find those those diamonds in the rough type of guys. Like yep. Isaiah Joe, who was cut by the Sixers, and Aaron Wiggins, who's a end of the second round pick, who's become huge for us. Um, he's done a good job of kind of, figuring that out. And then, you know, one thing I think the reason why the Thunder are ahead right now of the Pistons is also just because we started off with a eventual MVP level guy in Shea, which 
the Pistons didn't really have the chance to because they didn't have a guy of Paul George's caliber to trade away to begin the rebuild. They missed on um, so many picks for so many years that they just had empty cupboards with nothing to offer to anybody to get anything in return. Mm-hmm. And that it makes a rebuild so much harder. I mean, you even take a look at the Pacers who started the rebuild Tyrese Halliburton because they had DeMontis Sabonis to go ahead and trade away. I think that's, you know, it's obviously like a massive boost, but it's so hard to just be like, oh, just do that because you have to have one of those types of players in the first place, whether you, you know, trade for them and then you, or not trade for them, but you draft them rather and then develop them into that guy or they sign there. Like even with the Jazz having Lowry Markkinen now after the Donovan Mitchell trade or, you know, Walker Kessler, who's great from Rudy Gobert and all those picks going forward. It's just the Pistons were in a tough spot from the beginning. And I mean, yeah. Yeah, the lottery gods have definitely not done them any favors whatsoever. So it's, I know it hurts. I was, um, I was live streaming on uh, Bleach Report when the draft lottery was going on. I was reacting to that from a Thunder fans perspective because yeah. we had, you know, we were either going to get the 12th pick from the Rockets. If the Jazz fell a little bit, we could get their pick or the Rockets could have theoretically jumped with that pick. They did end up jumping with the Nets pick, of course, which is going to yep. be interesting to see what they do there. Um, but I remember seeing the Pistons at five and I immediately was like, oh my God, man, I cannot, cannot believe this happened to them again. Because I remember I saw so many Pistons fans that were like, are, are y'all excited to get the fifth overall pick again today? Like, it seemed like a lot of you guys knew that that yeah. is what was going to happen because that just felt like the most obvious punch in the face that could have come with yeah. everything that already happened. Well, and now that you are that team that lives through that experience and has those lottery odds. Uh, I, I also wonder if they need to maybe tune the system a little bit more in the other direction where, because mm-hmm. again, I think they've done a great job of de de incentivizing tanking, which, you know, was, which was the mission. There's more parody than ever. And I think they're doing a really good job in that light, but the way the lot, the way essentially the Pistons odds have been stacked up is well, yes, they, they can't fall out of the top five, And they had like 14% chance to get the number one overall pick. The way the odds stacked was they had a 47% chance both years to get the fifth overall pick. And while yes, in theory, that gives you 53% chance to be above that. That just seems so like disproportionately high to the others where that just seemed like the inevitability. You know what I mean? Like when when the draft, when the lottery was happening and the fifth pick was being announced, I said it in unison. With with the uh with with who I I think it's Mark Laurie who Mark who Tatum oh yep yep when he I mean I I literally said the Detroit Pistons right as he said it because like I just knew it was happening yeah and he that's a guy Mark Tatum every time he does it he's like announcing it no matter what happens he's always got a smile on his face oh, like so you know, happy for professional Especially mode when teams are getting screwed over like I but I swear with the, when the Pistons got that pick announced. Even for a moment, I saw like a, a twinge of, he was like, oh God, I can't believe that this happened to them again. Like, I, I swear I saw like, I don't even know if he fully put on that spot. It was just more kind of like, a, you know, like a little yep. mouth, mouth. If you're listening to audio, you have no idea what I just did. But like the straight face with like a little curve up at the end, like trying to kind of maintain that smile a little bit, but fighting so hard to be like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened to them again. Which I think was everybody's reaction when yep. that happened, so. Yeah, 100%. I think he knew the letters that were about to be coming into his office. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think the, the the thing that, you know, when you look back on, or at least when Pistons fans look back on this past season, I think, you know, obviously, you know, one of the biggest mistakes was, you know, their lack of aggression in the last offseason because they they also led, um, you know, th- this offseason, they will have the most salary cap space going into free agency. They also had the most salary cap space going into last year's free agency. But they essentially uh, push, you know, push the proverbial rock down the road. You know, they, um, you know, they they thought that if more pieces were healthy, that they would have a better record. They would be in a better position. They, I think, in my opinion, they way over relied on, you know, a, on a returning Cade Cunningham who had missed the, you know, the majority of the season before due to injury. He had the third highest usage rate in the pick and roll this year, I believe, um, which for a guy who's like in his third season and coming off of an injury is pretty insane workload. But as the season got on, like, especially like after January 1st, like Cade Cunningham was playing really good basketball. I'm not sure Mm -hmm. how much Pistons you ended up watching this year, because I would totally surprisingly a lot because I can't, (laughs) I can't lie, man. It was like, I y'all's losing streak. 
I, I wanted to see it end because you know yeah. I felt bad. You know, we're we're friends, and I have a lot of Pistons fans who are who I'm friends of, and I just felt really bad for y'all. But I I gotta be honest, like the whole y'all going for the historic losing streak thing combined with the wing stop that whole thing going on that meme was it like it was a it was the stars aligned for nba twitter it really one did. of the funniest stretches of basketball like it felt like every pistons game once the losing streak got up into like the 20s felt like you can't miss it like can't miss basketball yeah and i i did hit a decent bet because y'all were up big on the celtics at halftime i was like the celtics are not losing this yeah. game and i bet on them so i appreciate that from y'all but <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it, it literally became can't miss TV. Like I got to make a video on, I think it was New Year's Eve or like the day right before that was like the Pistons won a basketball game. And the fact that I was able to make that video, I was like, I watch a lot of Pistons surprisingly this season. So I, I, I definitely did keep up. And even after the losing streak, I like Cade and, you know, one, there was some progression from some of the guys. I liked the Sara a lot coming into the draft and had a really fun beginning to the season and stuff. So, yep. 100%. And I think where, you know, a lot of a lot of his season kind of, you know, went off the rails a little bit was, you know, from from I think what was the most puzzling aspect of the entire Pistons season, which I think is specifically the Monty Williams situation mm -hmm. where, you know, he was brought in at the time he was given the largest contract in the history, you know, of, of the coaching cycle, which, you know, I think in retrospect, he was just resetting the market. You know, he's now yeah. fifth on that list. So I think it was going to happen anyway. Right. But yeah. that's a whole other conversation. Nonetheless, he got a bag and a lot of years in, in a lot of security. And, um, you know, it, it, it kind of felt like the, the thought of that not working out never really passed Detroit's mind. And, you know, this season, you know, he was obviously the, the face of the losing streak, in my opinion. You know, you look at all the, like, the memes and the, the templates and things like that. Like, I, I, it felt like every other postgame press conference, something Monty said was getting mean. Right. Hmm. Um, from, from your perspective, you know, obviously, you know, Detroit fans all know about the Jaden Ivy stuff, him coming off the bench for like the first month or two of the season was pretty yeah. puzzling. Um, you know, and just, it, it just general, like the all bench lineups that he would roll out every single game when the Pistons had arguably one of the worst second units in the history of basketball, um, to, he was the reason that Killian Hayes was on the roster this season because he, he reached out to Troy and said, I want, I want a chance to coach him. I think I can fix him. And mm. that didn't happen. No, uh, you know, didn't so happen. just, just name, naming some of the things, but from your perspective, you know, like what, like what went wrong from your eyes? I don't know, man. I was one of the like Monty Williams defenders. I understood that I didn't hate that the Suns fired him just because it, it seemed like the whole franchise was going a different direction. They want a bit of a reset. I didn't love it necessarily, but I, I understood it. It was fine. Like, yep. I, I get it. I understand I, how the league works. You. Yeah. And then when the Pistons hired him, I was like, cool. You know, he was a coach of a team that made the finals not too long ago. They've had some really good seasons under Monty Williams. Uh, just give him a fresh face over there in the locker room. I really, really liked the hiring. And then the season began. And I was like, what the hell is going on? The Jay and Ivy thing, as an outside fan especially – I was so confused. Like the nights where he would be like the eighth man off the bench and stuff like that. Like that, it was mind blowing. You know, he wouldn't always play those type of minutes, but would be like the eighth guy to enter the game. It just never made sense to me. If you're going to be bad anyways, play your best two guys and give them a chance. Give Cade and Ivy a chance to develop alongside each other. Um, I know like just like you said, the, the bench lineups, Asar Thompson going from like really big as part of the team at the beginning of the season and then like really wavering throughout the year a lot to the point where he's like hardly playing at some nights. It was just wildly confusing at yep. times. A, a lot of stuff going on with the, the big man rotation between like Bagley and Wiseman and all that stuff. I don't know, man. It was a lot, which I don't – obviously, you know, I'm not privy to the information inside the organization, yep. but it was – there were moments where I was like, is he throwing? Is he trying to just get fired and get a bag and, you know, head out? Because I know there was that whole thing where he didn't really want to coach. Like he was going to take a year off or something. Yep. And the Pistons were like, no, take this money. We want you to coach. He's like, okay, cool. Sure. I'll do it for a billion dollars. Right. And it literally felt like at moments he, he was just throwing. And yeah. then, you know, there were some of the comments where he was saying stuff that just seemed like blatantly obvious to yeah. like, I think anybody watching, I wasn't sure if he was just, you know, not really wording it properly or just putting it pretty much a layman's terms, more complex stuff. 
but I don't think I've ever had my opinion of a coach shift so drastically throughout one, uh, the course of a season from where in the offseason I was like, this was a home run hire for the Pistons. Yep. You know, if it all works out, he could really be a culture changer to now being like, would it really be the worst thing for them to just swallow the rest of his contract and just get somebody else <laughs> to yeah. come into the situation? Yeah, it's it's puzzling because as someone that was that was in the building for the first time this year and, you know, someone mm-hmm. who came in with those exact same you know, perceptions, not, not saying that, you know, I, uh, you know, not saying that I have like a negative opinion of Monty Williams or anything like that, but, you know, just seeing someone who I thought was, you know, at the time he was, I, for my money, he was one of the best coaches in basketball to, you know, this year, so many, you know, like repeated situations where it's like, okay, but we know this doesn't work. You have to know this doesn't work. Where's the adjustment. And, you know, you're not alone in, you know, in having that theory of, is he throwing this like almost like, you know, there are beat writers, you know, with with the team that almost wondered if he was trying to send a message you know to to ownership about the you know where the roster was at and you know the Mm -hmm. overall you know construction of where things were so you know i'm interested now that you know the pistons have you know made the changes that they made you know with bringing in Mm -hmm. trajan langdon from new orleans pelicans a guy who's been you know a long time you know long time viewed as like one of the up-and-coming executives when the pelicans hired david griffin they almost hired him as the president instead, but they liked him so much that they offered him a big contract to work under David Griffin and to be their general manager. So now he'll finally have a shot at running his own team. He's already made the decision about the general manager. Will he, will he make that same decision about the coach? And I almost wonder if Detroit's in a similar situation, not to switch sports or anything, but it almost kind of feels like the, the Sean Payton, Russell Wilson situation where there's mm-hmm. mutual interest in that working for both parties where you want to make sure that like, you don't like, if you don't have to eat the rest of that contract, it would be beneficial for them not to have to. So I almost wonder if giving Monty one more season with a more competitive roster, better veterans, you know, like, you know, on paper, just a more competitive situation. Would that actually give us a better image of where Monty really was at fault with some of those things. But at the same time, would you also be able to find a candidate on the market right now mm-hmm. with other teams actively or already hiring coaches? Is it too late? You know, that's that's just they're in a really weird position. Yeah, which it, it's so tough because part of me thinks maybe they should just wipe this like clean. That was yep. an abysmal season. It was awful. It was the worst season in business history. They almost had the worst losing streak in the history of American professional sports. You just wipe the slate clean, you know, Troy Weaver gone as a Thunder fan. Sorry about that. Um, as you know, just fire Monty Williams, try and bring in some new names and just try to revamp this thing from the ground up and basically say to Pistons fans, because I know y'all are, you know, upset rightfully that it's going this way. Be like, hey, we know last year sucked. Let's just go ahead and start over. If they did that, wouldn't blame them at all. I mean, again, firing Troy Weaver, I think kind of indicates they want to show that at least a little bit. It is tough to swallow that whole contract if you're the Pistons because you just made him the highest paid coach up until this offseason. Uh, or I think maybe up until like Doc Rivers got hired by the Bucks I for think, like, also Pop literally got his extension like two weeks later and immediately you saw oh, them. I think I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. At the time, the most, you know, yep. the highest paid coach in the league. It it is a big admission of just like we messed up. Although, you know, things are changing now. It's no longer the same general manager. So maybe it's not the worst thing in the world, although it still reflects up on ownership, I guess, Yeah. which I, I know y'all don't have the best opinion of ownership either, um, or at least the Pistons fans I've talked to. So I, I'm not opposed. I think if you went with a new coach, it makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, you know, there has to be still something that you saw in Monty that still exists now, I guess. And if you do give him a more competitive roster, if you sign some guys in for agency, make good decisions in the draft and just give him a chance. I mean, what, what's the worst case you suck again and you just fire him anyways, you know, partway into the season. I don't think that's, you know, it's not going to mess anything up. Um, you know, if, you, if you're going to be bad anyways, I don't think, I don't think Monty Williams or a different coach is going to drastically change how this team performs next season. Yeah. Like, if the Pistons are hanging around a playing team, 
you know, say they're around that like 12 to 11 ish range. They're at the bottom. It, it's going to be just maybe a cup, a few wins in either direction, depending on who's the coach. I don't think it's going to change that much. It's going to depend a lot more on the talent that's in the building. And I guess it does give you some continuity with Monty Williams in the building, which maybe you do want for a young team that is going through a lot of changes already. If you're going to bring big names, that's a lot of change in the first place. So I, I don't hate it. Um, I am curious. Yeah, well, that that's another thing, too, because I was going to ask you, you know, if they got rid of Monty Williams, who would you even like as a head coach? But, like, you know, Mike Budenholzer has been scooped up. He was one of the top names that had been mentioned for a while now. You know, yep. all these teams are making their head coaching choices. The, the Cavaliers are obviously still going through that at the moment. But, like, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, who would you want as, like, even a coach? And I don't even really know who's established and available at this point. I guess, you know, like, the Thunder went the route with Mark Dagnall, who was our G League coach, and he just won Coach of the Year. So maybe it's something like that. Um, I know J.J. Reddick's out there. I don't know if you're interested in him at all at all as a candidate. But, yeah, yeah. I was curious if you had any thoughts. Yeah, if they I, did fire Monty Williams. Yeah, I if they fire Monty, I mean, one one thing I could I could foresee happening is – I could see maybe Dwayne Casey coming back one more year and taking over before they would, you know, if they wanted to like, you know, have a full extensive search the next season. I think that's mm -hmm. probably not likely. He still is within the organization in the front office. And I think he probably wants to, you know, stay that way. But the Steve Clifford special going back to the Hornets. Exactly. But speaking of the Hornets, I actually think James Borrego would be someone that would make a lot of sense. I've seen uh, a lot of stuff about him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's he's someone who's, you know, in the conversations with the Lakers right now. He has that connection you know, that Pelicans connection with, uh, with Trajan Langdon. So that would make sense. He, he took a Hornets team that really wasn't that good. And, and quite frankly, I think they overachieved. And the fact that they haven't quite been as good since James Brago left, I don't know if how much of that's a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Obviously there was the Miles Bridges stuff and, you know, a whole other litany of things too. But nonetheless, I think, you know, I, I, I think when you look at where the Pistons are at, like one thing I like about uh, Trajan Langdon is, you know, they kind of need people who are experienced in taking chicken and turning it into chicken salad. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And one thing about like, that, that was a well-timed bleed, by the way, that was very well-timed. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> with uh, like with Trajan Langdon, like he, like part of his experience that I like is not just like, you know, his, like what he's been able to do in new Orleans where, you know, even though like you can, you can say whatever you want about their record, about the star power they have, you know, whether or not they can compete for a title. They're one of the deeper rosters in basketball, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. Um, and he also came from the Brooklyn Nets, specifically when they had Karis LeVert. Jarrett Allen was instrument instrumental in getting those guys in the building. And that was like the all-time chicken salad team because they they had nothing. Like, they didn't have their own picks. They really had to, like, build their team around the margins and the scraps just to be competitive, right? So, and and... I know that you really want to be looking at things through the lenses of winning a championship and things like that. But phone just out of curiosity, uh, just a little pop trivia, like pop quiz for you. Do you know the last time the Pistons that I'm not talking about a playoff series. Do you know the, the last time the Detroit Pistons have won a playoff game? Ooh, because I know y'all made it that one year and Stanley Johnson was beefing with LeBron, which is yep. a crazy thing to look back on. Yep. They what year that was year, but they didn't win then. They Has it been about? It, they also made it the Blake Griffin year, and they didn't mm. win then either. Was it like for some reason I want to say like end of the, like two thousand eight or nine or something like that? Two thousand eight against the okay. Boston Celtics, the year they uh, it was the year the Allen Iverson year was the oh. last time that the Pistons have won that, a playoff game. That's a sentence. I'm a I was eleven, and I turned twenty seven like a week and a half ago. So it's been a bit. Late happy birthday. Hopefully you're, it was a good present to get the Troy Weaver firing. I, I I mean, honestly, like for me, like I I don't really like celebrate that stuff, especially like covering the team. But like it all yeah. serious is like it, the writing was on the wall the second they announced yeah. they're hiring I'm, a new president. I mean, you know it, I mean, it felt like, yeah, it, it it's so tough, like to make those I, I imagine you know those are tough decisions to go ahead and make like you bring him in and his first thing he has to be like is tell this guy who's been running the team that like hey you've got to get out of here kind of thing yep. you know yeah i don't i don't envy people in that position i'm not a very conflict like i'm not good with conflict i mm -hmm. could never be a dude who's out there like firing people and stuff like that i could never be in that position but yeah, man, I, it's just it, like you said, I think the writing was was on the wall. I mean, mm -hmm. after last season went so poorly and this year was somehow even worse, the, it, it was there was no way he was coming back. If he came back, I would have been stunned. Yeah, I mean, he 
compared to other general managers, I think he drafted really well, relatively speaking. I mean, mm-hmm. the Pistons were one of the many teams that missed on Tyrese Halliburton in that yeah. year. I think it's more, I think Detroit's just more heavily highlighted just because of the fact that they specifically drafted a point guard in that draft mm-hmm. in that spot. And it turned out to be Killian Hayes, who we all know how that turned out. Uh, and the crazy thing is, I kind of even like Killian Hayes a little bit in that draft. Like, I definitely did not. I was not one of the people that was like, oh, I hate that pick right off the bat. I was like, okay, cool. Like, I can see this. You know, it kind of right. makes sense. Right. I And and I wanted Halliburton at the time, but I'm not going to pretend to you that I thought Halliburton was going to be 10% of this. I, I thought he could be a solid point guard. I had no idea what his true ceiling was. And so, like, I wasn't, like, a passionate, like, we need Halliburton. But, um, yeah, like... The, like they, they still were able to get like a Cade Cunningham. They were still still able to get guys like Asar Thompson. I still think, you know, Jaden Ivey has a lot of potential and Jalen Duran as well. You know, you could potentially get some decent stuff in return for those guys. But, you know, the, the, the part where, that he really ultimately couldn't do was put a competitive roster around those guys. Like, I think mm-hmm. what Oklahoma City's done so well is they've put a roster around Shea that, that, that complements him, that allows yeah. him to play you know, to play his game, but also, you know, guys that fit around him, that make sense, that, that complement him where not all the weight is on his shoulders. You know, he still has to go out and be the guy, but he has other guys he can rely on. Whereas, Mm -hmm. whereas in Detroit, like our number one scoring option outside of Kate Cunningham was Bojan Bogdanovic, who was a second unit, like eighth or ninth guy for a playoff Knicks team he was traded over there you know what i mean like just yeah not good enough yeah and that's i mean again i've been as a thunder fan i'm extremely happy in the position we're in and i do think you know it took some luck but i think pressy has done a good job like we said you know grabbing jalen williams who has, i like going into the draft i was like hey if we get him that'd be awesome has even exceeded my expectations you know throughout his first couple seasons he's been unbelievable i think he's going to be an all-star level player is, is right around that range already and you know give it next season we'll see the west is insanely deep with talent out there i don't know if he'll actually make it but i think he's about to have that type of impact or already is right there on the cusp you know chat's been awesome and everything like that and i know you asked earlier you know what are my thoughts on Cade? i do still think Cade's really really good i'm one of the people who's i'm a big Cade cunningham believer i still am i know some people are out on Cade and they've kind of given up on him some people saying like, you know, sure, supporting cast is bad, but if he's that good of a player, he should still be able to elevate them. I mean, like the numbers he was putting up right before the end of the losing streak, if I remember correctly, were just completely absurd. He was dropping like 30 point games, like 40, point, like these hyper efficient games. And it just didn't matter. Yeah, and I, th- I don't I don't think people like give enough credit to the fact that basketball is a team sport. I think we talk about basketball way too much nowadays as like an individual basis, like, oh, 100 percent this player couldn't win a championship or, you know, this player couldn't get it done when it's, it's a team game. So Kate is doing everything he can. He was really, really solid this season by no means perfect. Like there are concerns with his game at times, but that's true for most players his age. There are very few players who are the a perfect example of a basketball player in the history of the sport, never mind at the age that Kate Cunningham is. Yep. And not to mention he's gone through the dysfunction that has been, you know, what, like the Monty Williams situation, like what's going on there. Like that's another new coach for him. He missed his entirety basically of last season. A lot of expectations were on him as a number one overall pick things, you know, players progress differently and not to mention no shooting at all for the Pistons last year whatsoever. I'm sure you know about that. The potential points like that were left on the table just off of his, you know, potential assists off of three pointers that were missed. It's off the charts. Like if he, if they just made a few more of them, he, like people I think would, would look at K and go, oh, he's mm-hmm. playing like that. Yeah, because I'm going to, I'm forgetting exactly what the numbers were, but I'm going to, uh, so Stalin this season was 22.7, 4.3 and 7.5. Like, he, like those are really, really good numbers yep. for a guy who's what? He's, he's 22 right now. Like he's. You know, a couple years younger than me, which continues to blow my mind. The Thunder had an average age lower than me this season, which they're they're one the you know one of the youngest teams in NBA history, especially to have the success that they did. But yeah. God, if that that did make me feel old, um, isn't that insane? Yeah, and, and then like Cade finished the season thirty two points against the Timberwolves, the number one defense in the league, by the way. Thirty three yep. against the Wizards, thirty six against the Grizzlies, eight assists, seven assists, two assists, couple of steals. 
even like the three point efficiency came up a lot. Cause I remember it was pretty bad to start the season if I remember correctly. Yep. And he ended up shooting 35.5%. Like Kate is really, really good. It just sucks that he hasn't gotten the talent that highlights him. And to me, that's what this off season should be for the Pistons. Um, I, you just need to get talent, get talent yeah. around Kate Cunningham. Even if, you know, you're not sure if they're guys that are going to be long-term able to help you compete for a championship or even help you like, like, no, there, I don't think there are many people that you can get in free agency right now, unless you get LeBron James, who I don't think is coming to Detroit. You know, may, maybe they spend the fifth overall pick on Bronny. We'll talk about on that. A, on a limb and say, <laughs> I don't think he's coming to Detroit either. Just a prediction. Yeah. Okay, Sean. I didn't, yeah. I, you know, I didn't want to upset you or anything hot like take. that. I've got a hot take. I've got a strong feeling that LeBron may not join the Pistons this offseason. <laughs> So unless it's like LeBron, you're not going to get anybody that's going to turn you into a championship contender this offseason. You know, right. maybe you have insane development and you're a playing team or even push for the playoffs because there is some question marks in the Eastern Conference. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility if you make the right signings, but just regardless, you have money, spend it, spend it yep. on somebody, like yep. add any kind of talent, even if it's, you know, like I don't know how you, this is just something off the top of my head. Even if like the Warriors are just desperate looking to dump Andrew Wiggins' contract, like they yep. just want to get off of it, absorb, you know, take on a pick, absorb the contract. Maybe Wiggins refines his form. If he doesn't, at least he's a player who's shown he could be a big time contributor on a winning team. Just get guys in the building, like yep. anybody, because I think, I think Malik Monk makes a lot of sense. I, think, I, I that think, is the name I want to bring up. Yeah. Yep. Malik Monk is one of my favorite potential pickups for y'all. Throw him a bag because yep. Malik Monk. I don't think people realize how good he is. He was my pick really to win sixth good. man of the year. Um, is one of the most clutch players in the entire league over the past couple of seasons. Has really developed into a an elite shot maker, someone who can play make at a high level. You give Cade another guy who can create next to him, which would be huge. I think you slot him in, you could slot him into that starting lineup next to Cade. You could bring yep. him off the bench. I feel like Malik Monk, if he's coming to Detroit, might want that starting spot, which I think is fine. You put Ivy off the bench, I think he can still thrive there. But I, I mean, I like Monk a lot. Just throw yeah. money at guys, whoever it is, yeah. give them money to just help the Pistons compete. And most most importantly, help Kate out. Cause I'm sure Kate is really frustrated at this yep. point with how good he's been playing. And the fact that y'all have won, what was it? 31 combined games over the past two years. Like, yeah, you Kate need, Kate needs more than that. So. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, these guys come into the league. They, they, I don't think they've lost 31 times in their lives at anything. So to mm -hmm. to come in and to face that level of losing, I, I can only imagine what's going through his head. But you know, like I, I I think another guy that makes sense. You brought him up for the Thunder actually a little bit ago is Nick Claxton. I still yeah. I'm still very apprehensive on giving up on like a Jalen Duran, but he still has a lot of room to grow as a rim protector and and on the defensive side of the ball. And I think that's where Detroit really needs that you know stability and consistency if they want to become the defensive team that you know that they talk about wanting to be so um mm -hmm. i also know that you know with langdon being in detroit i know people are you know making the connection to like brandon ingram as a potential mm -hmm. trade destination i think that makes i think that makes some sense as well um yeah. especially when you talk about how like you know in detroit you're never gonna be a true free agent destination but you know small market teams you can still trade for all-star caliber players and i i don't know if brandon ingram is a all-star but i'd say he's all-star caliber Especially yeah, in the for Eastern sure. Conference, I think. Oh yeah, for sure, days. for sure. Over in the East, that's yeah, that's one thing. I feel like people, I'll say someone is All Star caliber. They'll be like, they they haven't been an All Star. Like they're not going to be an All Star. Like yeah, because the the Western Conference has forty guys who could be an All Star theoretically. Like yep. Kyrie Irving, Jamal Murray, neither one of them were All Stars this season. And John Morant like didn't even play. Like you just take a look at the guard position; it's completely absurd, so. ridiculous. Yeah, I, but I, I, I like Brandon Ingram too because. I think a good example, and I mean, maybe he demands a trade or doesn't accept the extension, so maybe this doesn't end up working out. But I like Cleveland trading for Donovan Mitchell a lot, even if it doesn't work out. When you're a smaller market team like that, you've got to take swings on players yep. like that when you can, you know, if you're not. Because the Cavs were in limbo after LeBron left, but they got Darius Garland to really step up. Mobley turned into this high-level player, you know. I don't know how they got in on the Jared Allen trade, but that was an amazing ability by them to go in and get on that, get a guy in Jared Allen who has become this really good son. Just maybe had the best season of his career, even though he didn't make the All-Star game this year. But like, you have to take swings on players like that. You got to find ways to make it work. You know, what you said with um, Trajan Langdon, like trying to turn things that, you know, suck or bad situations into whatever you can. You just have to make stuff happen. So yep. I like the idea of Brandon Ingram. I 
I mean, I don't know how you feel about Zach Levine. How many years does he have left on his contract now? Is it? I think it's like th- two or three, but he, okay. I, I'm pretty sure uh, I, I saw something that his, um, that his value has gone down significantly. And I think if Detroit could somehow get draft compensation to take on that contract, I think it makes sense. I know yeah. Zach Levine was very close to being a Detroit Piston. Um, uh, this last trade deadline, like if he didn't go under the knife, he would have been a Piston flat out. Um, so like, that's, that's how close that was. I think it makes sense at the same time, you know, it is particularly telling in my opinion, uh, how much better the bulls got when Obi white was given the ball and Zach Levine mm-hmm. was, was out of the offense. Not saying that I think he was solely the problem in Chicago. I think a lot of things, you know, kind of, you know, really compounded to get them mm-hmm. where they are. But, you know, I, I definitely would be. I, I would definitely be concerned with the, you know, with the, the, the gravity of where the ball would be if Zach Levine is, you know, is on the, because you want the ball in Kate's hands as much as possible. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's a duo that could definitely work well together and you could set them up really well. And I think when you are in Detroit, you know, like when you're in Detroit situation, you know, you have to make risks like that. Um, but on the, on the flip side, to me, it just feels too much like the, like the Blake Griffin trade from 20 mm-hmm. you know like from 2017 2018 i believe um when um because it's it's a very similar guy where it's you know all-star caliber talent but re- injury riddled heading into his 30s you know to me when when you're talking about like you know detroit needing to get some surefire guys like they also need some guys that can last them a while too you know and mm-hmm. i just think i think that would just put them in a very similar position to where they were already at if that makes sense yeah yeah levine isn't one of my favorite guys i think it's like you said if you don't really have to give up anything for him and you just get compensation to take on his contract i think that's super cool like i'd I'd be down with that but yeah definitely not one of my favorite guys although like you said it's it's not the end of the world i think there is a way to go ahead and make it work yep um but yeah i'm trying to think of like other guys y'all go ahead and sign i was just right before i hopped on actually doing a, a live stream where i was talking about like thunder potential options in this off season and i was looking at a list of free agents for this off season and like like i'm trying to look at names that kind of makes sense because it's a pretty weak class overall yep. um, i mean if like philly's not bringing back buddy healed like i mean y'all throw money to just give a kate a shooter like i don't hate that at all yep um DeRozan feels like an insane decision to make. I don't think I would do that one, but yeah. I mean, he, if he he's going to get a bag from someone this summer, and it's going to yeah. be mind boggling. But you know what? Happy for Demar. Yeah, and he because like he still is good. I, it's going to depend on the years of the contract. Because exactly, if it's if it's crazy, yeah, we'll have to talk about that because he's about to turn thirty five. Um, like I'm trying to look at some potential guys. I mean, the thing is- like to me it feels like it's a great for agency class for just grabbing like role player type players like yep. a gary trent jr i don't hate that either a guy yeah. like him um but i think you know, the other <laughs> aspect as well though about this free agency mm-hmm. class it's it's going to be interesting the players that do become available because i think one thing people are still forgetting about is the tax aprons are going to become a thing this summer and That's so true. a lot of teams are very close or at that level and are not nearly good enough like atlanta is an example that's why the trey young and and Jante Murray conversations have been out there, you know, for like other teams for so long. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of teams are going to have to like make some decisions. And I think Detroit could potentially be like a benefactor of that. Um, yeah. I guess my last Pistons question before I quick ask you about the finals. Um, uh, I think Detroit's in a difficult position because I think in order to get better, they'll probably have to part with some young talent that they really like. Mm-hmm. And I think, and you look at their, I think their core four players, would kind of be, you know, I think it's pretty like universal. It's Cade, it's it's Asar, it's Jaden Ivy, or uh, J, uh, uh, yeah, J, Jaden Ivy and Jalen Duran. Of those four guys, you know, because like again with Detroit, you've you've traded players in the past, you've seen it blow up in your face. Mm-hmm. Of those four guys, like which ones would you want to build around? Because I think I think personally, if you're in the in the position of the organization, I think they're looking at Cade and Asar as like the two untouchable guys. But at the same time, Jaden Ivey has, has shown some flashes where he looks unworldly good. But at the same time, he has some flashes yeah. where it's like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I mean, that that's what happens, right? With these, these young guards. I think yep. that's 
people don't have enough patience with young ball handlers. We talked about the Cavaliers earlier with Darius Garland. His rookie season, he was statistically the worst player in the entire NBA. And yep. then he became an all-star level guard. Didn't have this great season this past year, but I think Darius Garland's still really good. It just hasn't worked the best at times with him and Donovan Mitchell trying to share the ball. And maybe, I mean, maybe that's a situation kind of similar to what's happening in Detroit, where Cade and Jane Ivey are both really good players, but maybe it just doesn't work. And to me, that's a tough spot. I, I really like Asar Thompson. He's got to find a jumper. Like, yeah. he has to be able to hit outside shots. What he shoot, like 15% or something like that from three this season? I know it was really rough. A lot of air balls. If Asar can develop a jumper, an incredible fit next to uh, Cade Cunningham. And even if it doesn't even have to be like, a great jumper if he can just shoot like 30 percent or like 32 get it up to their percent from three a massive impact player is corner next to three point, i think his corner three point shot like got to like like towards the end of the season i think he had a stretch where it was like 37 or 38 percent so like like mm-hmm. you know it sh- he even made some developments at in the off season i honestly of all the players of like on this team would need to develop a shot even though his was so bad i think i'm concerned about asar the least just because that's like that's a player that lives in the gym like he's, yeah that's true he's a guy they need to tell to go home yeah really all as, as long as a star is in the gym this summer and doing nothing but shooting like three-point jumpers i think that's big because a star i really like players that do he's a very unique young player there aren't a lot of young guys who are you know attacking the offensive boards the way that he is rebounding the defense is absurd already for Asar Thompson. I remember the like third game of the season or something like that. We went up against y'all and I think Shay had a pretty good game, but out of anybody guarding him, Asar was easily the most impactful. And I had, you know, watched some of him leading up to the draft, but watching him like in that NBA setting, I was like, this guy's so good. I was like, I really like Asar. He became two months. People forget and the streak really Mm -hmm. dampened it because he was all the all NBA defensive level. He was leading rebounds like in, for the entire league for a bit. Yeah, he was like a double double machine at one point. It's crazy the way that he was impacting the game while being so bad on that offensive end, particularly as a three point shooter. Yeah, uh, you know he ended up averaging six point four rebounds per game. I know the minutes fluctuated a lot, eight point eight points. I like a star a lot. I wouldn't want to trade him either. To me, he's one of the guys that should stay there. Yep. It is concerning, you know, if he doesn't develop a jumper, then you might have to have some questions. But even still, a guy who's able to, on a team that lacks defense, la- you know, needs guys that are going to put all their effort into the game, I think Asar is someone you should absolutely keep there. I like him a lot. Yep. Then it comes down to Duran and Ivy. I'm a, I'm a big fan of both. I've been I a big fan of Duran ever since the draft. You know, the defense isn't there at all yet for Duran. He needs to be better on that end. He's got to be a better rim protector for sure. But I think, he, you know, he's got that frame. He was also one of the youngest players coming out of his draft class, too. He was young last season. He gives you a lob threat, which I think is big for Cade, giving him that vertical threat out there. Uh, he's shown some really solid idea, um, just ideas as a playmaker out of that uh, short roll. You can give it to him on the elbow. He can make some plays. He's always given me a little bit of, like, a Bama to bio type feel. I mean, Bama's yep. one of the best defenders in the world, so that's very different. But a mold where he can be that impactful player on the offense that doesn't always need the ball in his hands, but can be that connective guy at the center position. That is my vision for what Jalen Duran can become. And like, I don't want to trade that either because if he does end up really locking in defensively with the frame that he has, or even just becomes like a pretty good defender, he doesn't have to become like a depoy level guy, just becomes a pretty good defender. Because you've got a SAR who I think a SAR could win a defensive player of the year 100% at some point. Although Wemby may just swallow the league and just dominate for 15 years and win 15 straight depoys. We may not stand a chance. The top I, I want to see though, are going to both live on that all defensive team. Oh, for sure. Like, Absolutely. Just, like them and Wemby just. Just get them a residency in the all defensive team list for the next 10 plus years. Yeah, we're going to look back at that draft as one of the best defensive drafts, I think, in NBA history. Yeah, and Derek Lively like, was 10th in that draft, and he's been as awesome as he was. Yeah, and then, you know, as a Thunder fan, I got to shout my guy, Casey Wallace, to what he Horton. did as a guard all season. Yep. Uh, there's some other defenders, too, that are like, I'm blanking on. I'm going to look at this, this draft real quick. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this was like, it was a very up and down season for Duran and I mean the Pistons obviously as a whole right. with the, the the losing streak and just development of players, but that's how it goes with young guys. And I still I'm a big believer in Duran, so I don't want to trade him either. 
I also don't, I don't want to trade Ivy, but I do think if anybody has to be traded, say there's a, a dream player out there that could really help y'all become more competitive. I think Ivy's the one I would most be willing to part ways with. I don't want to part ways with any of them. I do still think if you could just spend your money really well and maybe find bad contracts to absorb, you don't have to get like a, a star in this offseason. You don't have right. to. Obviously, you know, it's preferable. But if you can just get good winning players next to Cade, and maybe you're not a playing team next year, but rather than winning, you know, 14 games, you win like 30 something and yeah, you're right there in the mix the conversation. That's a start. Yeah, you're right there in the mix. Like, say throughout a majority of the season, you're in the mix for a play-in spot. But towards the end of the year, you fall off a little bit. And maybe for the last, like, 10, 8 games or so, you just basically bottom out because Cooper flags in this draft and getting him would be awesome. Yep. I think that's, you know, a perfectly fine season for the Pistons. Obviously, I'm sure you want to see the playoffs again. As someone who watched the Thunder only miss it for a few years, I desperately missed the playoffs, although I didn't miss the heart attack that games gave me. I was at game one against the Pelicans and... I almost passed out watching that game. I felt like, so yeah, I I think, I think Ivy, I guess is my answer, which I hate because he's, I really, really like Jaden Ivy as a player, Yep. but I do think with having your guard, in my opinion, assuming K continues to develop the way that he has. And I think he will continue to, you have a guard set with K. Then you have that wing and a star, that big and Jalen Duran. It hurts to give up that other guard, but I do think it makes the most sense just from a team building perspective, I guess. Yeah. Which I, a doubt. I, I hate my answer on that too. I hate any of the answers I could have given. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a crappy question because mm-hmm. like you said, like they're, they are like for a team that was so historically bad, they've got some good players. Like that's the part they, that's frustrating about it. So, they do. The, the potential is because, uh, you know, right now, like they don't work well together, but the potential is so there with all of them even though 100%. and that's like people I think often confuse people's play now with how good they're going to be. Cause I saw a lot of people saying like, Oh, can Kate ever be the guy? Because he was the best player on this 14 win team. It's again, goes to the conversation of it being a team sport, but also the vision with Kate is so mo- much more than what he did this season. And what was his second roughly full year with the team? Because even still, you know, there were some missed games here and there. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is a vision there, which is the hard part. What I think y'all are going to have to do is figure out what is the vision going forward to fix this thing without yep. looking back and being like, like you said, I mean, you'll, you'll trade someone and be like, damn, I can't believe we traded that guy. I mean, we traded James Harden. So like we get it as, yep. as Thunder fans, I get it completely. Yep. And I think that's why a lot of people are like so scared to trade anybody. They're like, oh, what if we make another big like Harden type mistake? That was a historic trade yeah. obviously and detroit like they don't have one that that that's that big but they have ones that make you look back and go wait chris middleton was on their team mm-hmm. you know what i mean like we had him in the system and just let him go for brandon jennings <laughs> you know what i mean like it's it's not james harden level mistakes but you know once you've made them so many times they stack up so yeah man i don't know it's it's tough. I mean, is your answer to that question also Jaden Ivy? Unfortunately, yes. I I would love to. I, I would love it if they at least gave this unit at least a half a season together. You know, like mm. just like one more run, like one more full training camp. You know, maybe if you do make a coaching change and decide that you know and see what you know a new coach could do with those guys. But you know, I, I, at the same time, when you like you said, when you look at the players that make the most sense, uh, when you look at the guys who could probably garner the most as far as you know, like. Like assets, you know that there's interest around the league for a guy like a Jaden Ivey. Um, mm-hmm. So, but on on the flip side, that's why you really don't want to trade him because he, it, like he, he to me for my money, he's still the fastest player in the NBA as far as like speed from up to down, up up and down the court. Like his his lightning speed is insane, and mm-hmm. and there's still a lot of a lot of upside there to explore. But you know that that is the the tricky thing with Jaden Ivey's game is just how streaky he is. Because one month he was like yeah. 30 plus percent from three. Then the next month he was like 23, 24%. So, and again, that's, that's any player, like you said, especially any young guard, but well, Cone, yeah. before we get you out of here, I, we could, I, we could talk about this all day, but I gotta, I, I, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't ask you at least a little bit about this final series that we're about to mm-hmm. be watching, because I think this has, you know, and I feel like I've said this every year, but I truly believe this has the chance to be one of the best finals we've seen in a long time uh, between yeah. 
in two teams that have a lot of pressure on their shoulders. In particular, I think if Boston loses this, I think it will be an all time, you know, like meltdown on like in the off season from their fan base. Where what's your mindset going into this series? And, you know, obviously I want to know like who you're favoriting, but what are you what are you excited to watch within this series? I mean, I think just from a thing about the narratives, we'll, I'll talk about the basketball in a moment, but starting with like the narratives going to the series, the storylines, there might not have been a better series out there, whether it's Kyrie going up against Boston out of all teams in the finals where he, you know, was flicking off the fans when he was with the Nets and he said, I want to resign here and then didn't resign was stopping on the logo and there was all that stuff. And now he's going over to Dallas and he's found success playing next to Luca. He's gone from leaving Cleveland, trying to become the guy, to the whole thing with the Brooklyn Nets, to now he and Luca become this unbelievably synergistic backcourt over there that is dominating everybody. Then you've got Kristaps going up against his former team, and Luca said in a recent interview that you know he and Kristaps are cool, but there were reports all throughout his time over there in Dallas that there was a little bit of tension between him and Luca. So that is a thing over there, as well as, like you mentioned, I mean the weight on the shoulders of all these guys. A lot of people are ready to crown Luka as the best in the world. And hey, if he wins this series and, you know, grabs finals MVP, I'm sure he will. That's perfectly fine, in my opinion, to go ahead and call him that. And you take a look at what Tatum has done over there for the Celtics, who is, he's been ridiculed a lot. The Boston Celtics have, if they go ahead and say they dominate this series, like they've dominated the league this entire season, I think there will be a lot more conversations had about Tatum and how good he actually is because I do believe Tatum has gotten underrated by a lot of people. I think people look too much at how they don't like Boston and attribute that to Jason Tatum. And I say this as someone who wasn't even the biggest Jason Tatum believer earlier on in his career. I was like, oh, maybe he'll be like a, he'll probably be like an All Star level guy. I can see that, but maybe never like an All NBA first team guy. Now he's already with the All NBA teams he's racked up, probably getting close to Hall of Fame status. And I mean, if he wins a Finals MVP here continues to put up these numbers, he's easily on that Hall of Fame trajectory. It's not even close. So there's a lot for him on the line here, especially after how 2022 went, and he really struggled in that finals. He was outplayed by Andrew Wiggins, who he was shade tweeting like years ago yep. uh, when he's like when he's like 15. Uh, then for Jalen Brown, you know, being called like a way overpaid that the contract wasn't worth it. And the Celtics have invested a lot in this. They gave Drew Holiday an extension. They extended Chris Ops Porzingis. This is their team. Like this is their chance. The Mavericks are really good, but they are a five seed, I guess, relatively to the Celtics. So in, just in terms of seeding, and they are being favored pretty heavily in this series, there was a lot on the line for both sides. But I do think the Celtics have, I guess you could say, more pressure on their shoulders to go ahead and get this done. So just from a storyline perspective, I mean, there's stuff all over the place. And then you take a look at the basketball. How do the Celtics defend Luke and Kyrie? Is it, you know, Derek White kind of got torched by Luke in their regular season matchup. So I would imagine it's more likely a Drew Holiday on Kyrie. And then you put like Jalen Brown, say, for example, on Luka Doncic. But the Celtics just also just have so many great defenders. You could throw anybody at him. You could put Derek White, Drew Holiday, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, like all these all-defensive, fringe, all-defensive level guys. They're all over the place. And with KP coming back, assuming he looks like himself, which is a whole nother storyline in itself, what does he bring to the table on that end? And he has been massively impactful for them all season. I don't think enough people have talked about how, sure, the Celtics played a pretty easy path to the finals relatively because teams were injured, but they were without KP, who was their second 2A, 2B, maybe even third, depending on how you look at it, best player this season behind Jason Tatum and probably Jalen Brown. So they're now coming into a a whole other level. Exactly. The reason they won the Eastern Conference by like 16 games is because they added KP. He changed everything for them both you know, with the, the floor stretching out that five spot, the rim protection, the post-up element that he's really added to them this season too. It's been revolutionary. So there is a lot that makes me lean this, the Celtics in this series because when I take a look, they are the more talented team. I think schematically they have more ways they can attack you. They're more versatile with one of the best starting fives we've seen in a long time in the NBA. But and then with Dallas, it's it's Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving, like what they've been doing, and they're not slouches slouches either. I mean, I still have nightmares about PG Washington drilling corner threes against the Thunder. It was insane what he was doing against us. Not, yeah, Derek Jones Jr. What what I'll tell you, I've learned very recently that there are certain moments that will make you be like, okay, this game or this series is over, especially in the playoffs. Would Derek Jones Jr. hit that turnaround shot over Chet Holmgren falling to the ground with like no seconds left on the shot clock? I was like, okay, I think we might be cooked here. And then Kyrie, or right around that time too, hit the three that bounced straight up and came right back down in. I was like, we're just not destined, it seems like, to win this game. 
Yep. Uh, I think of the Rudy Gobert turnaround shot. I was just going to say the next thing, the Rudy Gobert fadeaway over Jokic. I was like, oh, the Wolves are winning this 100%. I still don't think I believe that shot went in. Like, like you could show it to me again, and I'm like, that's AI. Like, I just... Oh, for sure. Yeah, and I'm not talking Allen Iverson. <laughs> yeah, no. Although... If you want to talk about the most AI looking play that Rudy Gobert has ever made, it's that one. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, that I, I'll, that'll be one we'll have to tell our grandkids about where we'll we'll be like, no, I promise this actually happened. Yeah, no, sure. like Rudy Gobert actually did that. Like, here's yeah, the video. And they're even yeah. going to be like, okay, that's edited. But. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> they're like, grandpa, you're 98 years old. What are you talking about? I'm like, yeah. no, trust me. The Rudy Gobert fadeaway was cinema. Yeah. But like, I do worry a little bit more about their supporting pieces because PJ wasn't great shooting against the Wolves. The Celtics yep. are the Wolves are the better overall defense, but I think the Celtics are better equipped to handle the Mavericks and slow them down. I don't know if you can truly stop Luke and Kyrie, but you could definitely slow them down a little bit and they're going to have to. I worry about some inconsistencies with Boston from the three-point line. Like if they're not hitting their threes, they look very human. Although if they are hitting their threes, they look unstoppable. It's very yep. up and down, you know. Um You've also, I mean, another storyline is like Joe Mazzulla and Jason Kidd, two coaches people both said kind of sucked throughout the season. Have They've made it to the finals, so. We're going to maybe... find out a lot about Joe Mazzulla in this series, in my opinion. Yeah, this is his first time kind of on this stage. I mean, Jason Kidd, you know, didn't coach in the NBA finals with like the Bucks or anything like that or the Nets, but he played it as a player. I guess he's been here before. It, it's really interesting. Um I am leading Boston, even though Luke is the best player in the series, which maybe just takes over the edge. I just, if Chris Dobbs looks like himself, if he doesn't, this becomes a little bit scarier. But I do believe that if KP is playing like the way that KP has all season, the talent that the Celtics have on the roster is just overwhelming. Great defenders all over the place, knockdown three point shooters. You know, Al Horford now coming off the bench, who was great in a couple games in that Pacer series. Jalen Brown is playing maybe the best basketball of his career right now. Yep. They do need Jason Tatum to be better from three. He's shooting like 29% from the outside in the playoffs so far. Need him to be a little bit better in that regard. And this is a really good defense, the best one they're going to have played so far. I I just think there's too much talent with Boston. I picked them before the season. I picked them going into the playoffs. I'm going to stick with them, you know, up until the, the very bitter end, which Mavericks fans are giving me a lot of crap for on my video about them yep. the other day. I made my series preview because I picked the Thunder to win that series against them because, of course, I did. I was. And now you have to like Thunder. bitterly. Now you have to like bitterly go like, hey, I'm not being bitter. I promise. This is the pick yeah. I made. Exactly. And it's like I picked against them with Minnesota because I was never the biggest. I, I picked against the Wolves in both their series. Clearly, it was a mistake against the Suns, but I picked against the Wolves twice. So either way, I was going to be picking against a team like again for the second series in a row, third one in a row if it was picking against Minnesota. Yep. So I, I, picked, I picked the Wolves to win that series. And now there are people that think I have a vendetta against the Mavericks because... I picked them in like I what I thought were two toss up matchups against them. Yep. And now we reach another one where I think the Celtics are the better team, but the Mavericks can absolutely get it done. And I, I, I'm just going to go Boston. I said on YouTube seven games. I think I'm more so leading six now. I just think the talent is overwhelming for that team. Plus, they've played such an easy path up to this point relatively. Maybe that means the Mavericks are more battle tested. But with the talent the Celtics have, honestly, I'm not too worried about it. Not to mention the Mavericks have been really good in clutch games. But the Celtics are 4-0 in the clutch in these playoffs so far. Like, they have been really good in the clutch, which has always been a concern. Maybe it's a more highlighted issue against a better team in Dallas. But I feel like so far they ha they've they shown me that they can execute in those late-game scenarios. So I'll just trust them for now until they inevitably burn me in the finals. Also, I tweet out during the regular season, I don't know how anybody's going to beat this Boston team four times. It seems impossible or something along those lines. And people relentlessly clown me for that tweet saying that some people thought I was just a Celtics fan, which very much not. No. Um, yeah. And then, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's the same old Celtics. Like they'll always choke. I, part of me just wants to see the Celtics win so I can go back to that tweet and be like, y'all clown me for this. Yeah. And then they went out there and ran through the Eastern Conference. They, you know, won the finals, maybe convincingly, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, part of me wants to go back and run victory laps with that tweet. So we'll see. But I think if I've got to give you like a full team pick and game prediction, I would probably go Celtics in six with Tatum winning finals MVP. Yeah, I think that's totally fair for me. The reason why I slightly lean Dallas is, is a lot of what you just laid out a second ago about, you know, the ability to play in the clutch. I think with Dallas, mm -hmm. you have two of, you know, two of the most confident players in the fourth quarter, perhaps ever play the game of basketball. And yep. on the, on the flip side with Boston, as you said, they, they've been good in the clutch in the playoffs, but I also wonder how, 
you know, how much in those moments they have truly been tested with Donovan Mitchell, yeah. you know, miss, you know, missing pretty much all that series, Tyrese Halliburton missing pretty much all that series. So going up against, not only did they not really have to go up against like one star during those moments. Now they're going to have to go up against, you know, two players who are just, you know, explosive in that, you know, in, in that mode, you know, and, and like you said, if, if Chris Hotsports is, is healthy and is, you know, like fully, you know, out there and able to play and, and, and be like, even just like 80% Chris stops for Zingas. I think Boston has a really good shot, but to me, you know, that my, my concern with them is never, you know, their, their, their talent. It's never, you know, the, you know, the players that they even have that are like, you know, I, I, I like you believe a lot in, you know, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. I think, you know, they're both are playing some of the best hoops they've ever played, but, you know, I still think there isn't clarity of who is the alpha within the final minutes, like who's going to, you know, who's going to get the ball, who's going to like, who, who are we drawing up the shot for? Um, and, you know, I, I just, I wonder, you know, especially in this situation, how much they're going to miss, you know, like miss an Ime Udoka, you know? So I, I, I just, I, mm. even though Boston has looked as good and, and it's, it, it's hard because like you said, all logic, everything points towards Boston should win this series. But when you have Luca playing at the level that he's been playing, Kyrie looking as good as he's he's looked since 2016, and you know the the um, the level of play that they've gotten from their from their supporting cast, it just feels like momentum is on their side as well. That's why mm. it's hard to pick against Dallas right now as well. But they're they're but Vegas has them as the third biggest uh, underdog since the merger, so that's pretty pretty crazy in itself because i i think this is a lot more of a toss-up than that yeah i don't agree with that necessarily the the mavericks definitely have that team of destiny feel to them yep for sure there has never been a five seed that's won the finals luca feels like on a mission to show that he's the best player in the world Kyrie, like it would literally be the ultimate revenge storyline if he beat boston in this series it does feel like they have that team of destiny feel and that's part of why I feel bad. Like, I don't, I agree. I don't think it's that much of a, a slam dunk in favor of Boston. I think there is a world where if the Celtics just start firing at all cylinders, this one's over in like five. Like, yep. I could see them just dominating. I don't see the Mavericks winning this series in four or five. I think if they win, it's in six or seven. I can see a world where Boston kind of slams on the gas and just annihilates them. They're yep. like, hey, this is who we've been all season. We're going to show you here now. But they, they've just had this, like they have had all those moments in the past where it's like, and I do think people have been disingenuous to Boston. I've yeah. seen people say they're always the favorites and they always choke. Like they've very rarely been like lost series where they were favorited in. It's not super often other than like some of the Miami series. Um, but I don't believe they're favorited in the finals. They might have been. I don't remember. It was a toss up kind of with that one. Yeah, they, they were also going up against Stephen Curry playing some of the best hoops of his life. You know, like I think people, you know, I, I think Boston gets too much flack for that series when I think. You know, it can be true that a team didn't play that well, but also Golden State was playing some really inspired basketball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he. I mean, he had the Seth Curry finally gets an Finals MVP script on his side, so it yep. was it was written in stone already. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, yeah. While I don't agree with those people saying, "Oh, Boston was choking the favorites" or anything, there were moments like throughout this year. I can remember a lot of big time games where I think I've even tweeted about this multiple times this year where it's like the Celtics somehow find a way to get the most contested and like ugliest shots in the clutch at times. It's yep. just extremely frustrating. And I do worry, you know, going up against Luke and Kyrie, who are like the clutch duo in the league right now, how is that going to look? And even if Luke and Kyrie aren't the guy scoring, PJ's hitting big shots or Derek Jones Jr. is hitting big shots and Lively has been unbelievable in these playoffs. So... Yeah, I don't know. One thing I, I also want to note is like Daniel Gafford was pretty rough in that. Like he was almost unplayable in that game against Boston in the second half of the season where they got annihilated. The Mavericks did on Boston's home court. So I'm interested to see how he looks in this series because, yep. you know, he's held up. He's had some really good moments, but Lively's been clearly the better big so far. So yep. we'll see what happens with him against Boston, too. And I'll, and I'll tell you what, man, I think, honestly, the reason why I, I, I my rooting interest might lean towards Dallas I am rooting for Derek Lively this playoffs, like unapologetically, mm. just with the things that that kid has went through and, mm. and and how awesome he's been as a player, but how awesome he seems as a human. It would just be really cool with, you know, losing his mom like a month or two ago and, and losing his dad at early childhood age to come in his rookie year, you know, get drafted top 10 and now win a championship as a rookie like like that, that you can't write a better story than that, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lively, I, I've i always really liked his game. You know, he seems like an awesome guy. And then watching him, the way that he has elevated himself throughout these playoffs to become the big the Mavericks needed. Like, there were people talking about, like, oh, should they trade for, like, a Clint Capella or any one of these established bigs to fill that role because that was a huge question mark coming into the season. And then, boom, Derek Lively is immediately that guy. Amazing lob threat, you know, playmaking off the short roll, putting back those shots, rebounding monster at times too. I can tell you again, firsthand going up against the thunder nightmares of him grabbing offensive rebounds for PJ Washington threes. I will see it replaying in my head forever until the thunder win a championship. (laughs) So damn it. I I mean, I really don't blame people if they feel either way. Like that's my big thing is yeah. I'm not so new. I don't think the Celtics are going to annihilate the Mavericks. I just don't see it happening. I think there's a world, like a few scenarios but I don't think it's this one. I yeah. think this goes at least six or seven for whoever wins. I'm yeah. I'm just going to lean Boston because I think there's a talent advantage, but it's just so hard to bet against that team in Dallas who does have that team of destiny feel to them. Yep. And I mean, just did find a way to not go to a single game seven. against a tough Western conference. Like the thunder are really good. I'll say that as a thunder fan, the Mavericks just knocked off the nuggets out of all teams. Like they were really, really good. And the Mavericks found ways to go out and make them look very, very human at times, which is yep. impressive. 100%. It's going to be it's going to be phenomenal basketball. And the good news is, you know, normally most summers you have to wait a long time for hoops to come back, but I think with you know with the surgence of the, you know, like with how the explosion of the WNBA right now with both men's and women's Olympic basketball as yeah. well, like we got a pretty full hoop summer, man, and I think I think it's going to be And phenomenal. a big Pistons off season ahead of us. Yeah, exactly. Ex- I mean, the most important thing of all I mean, right exactly. there. Yeah, yeah. Olymp- Olympics, all that stuff. No, it's yeah. Pistons off-season yeah. time. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, and- yeah. Tell me what Trajan Langdon's up to. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but- that, that, I don't care about any of these other transactions. Shams Woj, mute those. I, give me Trajan Langdon updates. I need exactly. the, the Trajan Nothing Langdon this music Lakers account. Head coach mess. JJ Redick. Blah blah blah. Tell me Trajan Langdon's daily agenda. Is there a Trajan Langdon music account yet? Has that happened? I feel like that's I, not if gonna- not, it's coming. You know, the second second he makes any kind of big move, I think it's it's on the horizon. So, yeah, there, there's got to be a muse account for everything at this point. It, it's crazy. oh, 100 percent. I think yeah. I tweet about that or something. And I had the most obscure muse accounts. I didn't even think were possible replying to my tweet, Yeah, which very tangentially. But I was at a concert last night and it's crazy how many obscure jerseys you'll see just at a concert or something. I saw a jazz Paul Millsap jersey yesterday. Keep in mind. I'm in Virginia. Like I, we are very far away from Utah. Yeah, Jazz Paul Millsap. Paul Millsap jerseys, let alone like in in Virginia. Yeah, and for like Utah, it wasn't even like Hawks Paul yeah. Millsap or anything like that. It was like early career Paul Paul Millsap. I saw an Adrian Dantley one too. I don't know why all the Jazz jerseys were out at the game. Yeah, like I or not the game, the concert. One of my friends is like Dantley. Who's that? I was like Adrian Dantley. Why is there that jersey? I saw a Larry Johnson Hornets jersey. There last night too. Oh my! Which gosh. I guess it's closer to Virginia, Charlotte. Like right. that's pretty close. But I, I I don't know. It was just crazy. The amount of, I saw a Russell Westbrook Rockets jersey too, which is a you know Russ fan. Shout out to that guy. Yeah. But it was a very weird day of seeing jerseys. Like just I, the the strangest. I think I, I even saw this is you know again moving off to a different sport a Desmond Trufant like like Falcons jersey, which was so random. That is bizarre. I, it was it was insane. I've never seen as many weird jerseys as I did last night. It was it's very fun to see those, but oh, especially yeah. like going to summer league the past couple of times. You will see the most random jerseys in your entire life at summer league. So oh. if anyone if anyone ends up going there, keep an eye out because you'll see some all time great ones. Oh, I can only imagine just like at that NBA convention, just the amount of Zydrunas Ilgalskis, Anderson Varejao jerseys. Who knows? Maybe we'll even see like a page of Stojakovic. Seku Dimboya. Oh boy. Oh yeah. Piston, Pistons legend, baby. Oh yeah. The, the, the real French phenom. Sorry, Wimby. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, seriously, you're the dude. Thank you so much for taking the time. Appreciate I it, could literally talk hoops with you all day, man. This is an absolute blast. Where yeah, can, for sure, man. Where can people find you? Uh, where can people find your work at, man? Yeah. So I do my own YouTube thing. Uh, three cone. It's all spelled out. T H R E E C O N E. Um, do same thing on, over on Twitter, three underscore cone over there. I uh, got some exciting stuff in development on that, on that end with the, the YouTube and, you know, getting more into the media space. So definitely make sure to go ahead and check that out. Um, Instagram. I just post like random photos, uh, three cone also on there. 
And, you know, I do my thing on Bleach Report too, three underscore cone, I think on the BR app. Mm -hmm. I do live streams like six, seven times a month, depending on what is going on, you know, what part of the season it is. So if you want more like live content, like I hop in, I interact with the chat, you know, talk Thunder a good bit, but also just general NBA stuff. I think I'll be talking about the finals and the draft coming up here soon. So if you want more stuff on that, make sure to go check that out too. But Real quick, I want to appreciate say thank you again, man, for having me. It was a lot of fun. Like you said, I could sit here and talk hoops with you yep. forever. It's been a blast. I can't believe it's already been an hour and twenty minutes it about flew to be by, here. dude. It, it, it feels like I flew by. It feels like I blinked and here we were. But yeah. yeah, man. I mean, I'm always down to come hop on the podcast. Maybe we can after both our teams do their off seasons, we can yep. see where we're at. Hopefully, uh, you know, Trajan Langdon cooks the way that Trajan Langdon Muse hopes he does. Yep. And we see some, <laughs> some star power over in Detroit coming up here soon, man. Yep. Langdon Muse. We got, we got to get that the clock. We got to get that finals appearance that or finals match of that we were talking about, man. We do, man. We do. Pistons Thunder Finals. It will happen eventually. And when it happens, we will be there, Cone. We well, will. We will be there. Yeah. We will. But seriously, man, keep killing it. Keep up the awesome work. Just appreciate you. And thank you to everyone for listening and joining this episode. If you like the podcast, be sure you like the video. Subscribe down below. And we'll catch you guys next time from Half Court. Be sure you subscribe.